break into your discussion groups at the end. So it's it's funner in in a group. It's kind of lonely when you're by yourself. Just talk to yourself. It's a lot of pressure to keep up the whole conversation. Okay, so you guys may see on your table, if you are sitting at a table, you should have a printout of Psalms 84 already on your table. And I didn't bring pens today, but if you have a pen in your purse, or you're sitting next to someone who has a purse, maybe see if they have two pens. If not, Chris here has a lot of color crayons. Maybe he'd share a crayon with you. And you don't have to do this. This is America. You're free. You can make a paper airplane out of this paper if you want to. However, I think that, I think God's gonna do something cool today through Psalms 84. So I was, I love God's presence more than anything. I really do. Way back in 1992, I believe it was, before we planted this church, Graham Cook prophesied to my parents, knowing that a church was, I don't think we knew that the church was gonna be planted, but I think Graham Cook knew that we were about to, just prophetically. And he said to them, outlaw everything but the presence of God. And let that be your plumb line. And that's truly our heart, is that the presence of God is the first thing it's the main thing. It's our one thing. It's everything. It's, it's primary. And all of the things that we're concerned about that we want to experience come from his presence. And I was thinking about that this week. And I was also just um, kind of reliving Nathaniel's message a couple weeks ago where he was talking about Moses in, his, in Exodus 33 and how Moses um, had the place of meeting, the tent of meeting, and it was outside the tabernacle. It was the place where Moses went to meet with God face to face as a friend, which is, it was revolutionary at that time. People didn't go meet with God face to face as a friend. It's not revolutionary now because Jesus tore the veil. He made open the way and brought us back into that communion, that union with the Godhead face to face as it always was meant to be all the way back to the garden when they were there. And in John 1 where it says, you know, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. And it talks about face to face. They were there together, face to face. That's in the Passion Translation. So Moses had this revolutionary um, lifestyle with God, where he would go and he would make the tent of meeting. And Nathaniel's question to us and what we talked about in our discussion groups was, what is our tent of meeting? Do you have a tent of meeting? Which really means, do you have an intentional place, an intentional time, an intentional way that you encounter God, that you choose to commune with the Lord as a friend. And that's really where it all comes from, right? So these are the musings, and this is where I came to. Um, I was just looking at Psalms 84, because I'm thinking about that place of meeting, this encountering God. We tend to, let's just you can just throw out your answer. What's the number one thing that comes to mind when you think about going to meet with God? Like, locationally, what do you, what do you think of? Heaven. Heaven? Great answer. Anybody else? My couch. Your couch. You have a spot. Your prayer booth. Your fruit tree? Your prayer chair. That sounds just like fruit tree. <laughs> um, 
with pen and paper. You guys have great answers. I was expecting you to say at church. I'm so glad you didn't say that. You have great answers. But I think that overall in Christendom, we do think like the place of meeting is what we're doing right now. When it's all those things you just said. And Psalms 84, um, kind of, it's a psalm about his presence. It's a psalm about the longing in our heart to go and meet with God, right? And so this, I put it out on um, your, your tables. It's in the Passion Translation. And I just want us to do something today. And we're going to read through it. And I want you to think, like, underline and circle certain words that stand out to you. Think location. And um, so, like, place and posture. Does that make sense? Like location and how, or method. So we'll jump in and I'll explain. But the very first one is God of heaven's armies. You find so much what, beauty, in where, your people. Do you get what I'm trying to say? So you can underline it, you can circle it, you can put stars around it, whatever you do to kind of um, mark those things. But have it be like a kind of a consistent mark. So what the posture would be one, and then where would be another type of marking, okay? Does that make any kind of sense to you? Yes. Yeses and noes are awesome. Yes? Okay, great. Okay, so I'm just going to read it through, and then we'll break it down. The Passion says that this psalm is set to the melody for the Feast of Harvest. I wonder what that melody is. Do you know, Angela? Nope. Nope? Okay. You were my best bet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Ron knows apparently. <laughs> it's beatbox. Okay, so this psalm is set to that, that song, and it starts out God of heaven's armies, you find so much beauty in your people. They're like lovely sanctuaries of your presence. Deep within me are these lovesick longings, desires, and daydreams of living in union with you. When I'm near you, my heart and my soul will sing and worship with my joyful songs of you, my true source and spring of life. O oh Lord of heaven's armies, my King and my God, even the sparrows and the swallows are welcome to build a nest among your altars for the birds to raise their young. What pleasure fills those who live every day in your temple, enjoying you as they worship in your presence. Pause in his presence. How enriched are they who find their strength in the Lord. Within their hearts are the highways of holiness. Even when their paths wind through the dark valley of tears, they dig, a deep, they dig deep to find a pleasant pool where others find only pain. He gives them a brook of blessing filled from the rain of an outpouring. And they grow stronger and stronger with every step forward. And the, gods, the God of all gods will appear before them in Zion. Hear my cry, O God of heaven's armies. God of Jacob, listen to my loving prayer. Pause in his presence. God, your wraparound presence is our defense. In your kindness, look upon the faces of your anointed ones. For just one day of intimacy with you is like a thousand days of joy rolled into one. And I'd rather stand at the threshold in front of the gate beautiful, ready to go in and worship my God, than to live my life without you. In the most beautiful palace of the wicked. For the Lord God is brighter than the brilliance of a sunrise. Wrapping himself around me like a shield, he is so generous with his gifts of grace and glory. 
Those who walk along his paths with integrity will never lack one thing they need, for he provides it all. O Lord of heaven's armies, what euphoria fills those who forever trust in you. I love that song. So, right out the gate, I love what David is saying here. God of heaven's armies, you find so much beauty in your people. They're like lovely sanctuaries of your presence. His presence is found in us. His presence is found in you. I can go and tap into God's presence by being in community, by being connected to people. God so loves community and connection that he places his presence right in the middle of people. So I think sometimes, you know, when we like to be in God's presence, it's kind of a personal thing. And I'm not talking about just this corporate worship time. I'm talking about at the dinner table. I'm talking about at volleyball games or football games or whatever match floats your boat. I'm talking about fishing boats, hunting trips. I'm speaking your language, right, Oracle? That's right. I'm talking about coffee dates, park play dates, the real life, the nitty gritty stuff, the weight loss groups, the different things that we do that we connect to people. And there is an aspect of God's presence that you will never see as a Lone Ranger. There's an aspect of who God is that we will never get to on our own. We'll see lots of beauty, we'll see lots of cool things, but his presence is found in connection with people. I think that's cool. What do you think about that? It's good stuff. Verse two, so if you're, if you're underlining that, he finds beauty, that's, a, that's what he finds. Where? In his people. What are they? They're sanctuaries of his presence. So now verse two, deep where? Within me. So inside of me, God has placed his presence through what? Longing, desire, daydreams, in life, in communion with God. Okay, you hear what I'm saying? In my own life, in my own union with God, he's placed inside of me. Now this is personal. So he's placed inside of Chris. Longings, desires, and daydreams with God. And God's presence is in all of those things. One of my favorite things to do on the earth is to daydream with God. I've been really getting in trouble with some of my daydreams with God. Like physical harm, <laughs> because I'm daydreaming <laughs> too hard. I've, I haven't run in a while, but I, Whenever I did, I would be running and daydreaming with God and then suddenly realize I'm in the middle of the road because I'm daydreaming with God. I got in a car accident a couple months ago because I was daydreaming with God. Like I take my daydreams to another realm. So I need to, I need to think about where I'm daydreaming. Make sure I'm in a padded room or a safe landing place because I'm getting pretty wild with my daydreams with God. And I get lost in them. I've been known to run down the road weeping at just the daydream that I'm having with God. It's, it's our time. That's my time to be with Him. And, and I imagine all the cool things that He wants to do in my life, through my life, with my life, and all that is part of it. I daydream with God about my kids. I daydream with God about my finances. I daydream with God about my husband. The list goes on. I daydream with God about you. 
A lot of what we do is comes out of my daydreams with God. And sometimes his presence is like, eh, that's your daydream. <laughs> but most of the time, like he leads me in those daydreams. I long to be in his presence. It's innate inside of me. It's innate inside of you. It's like you were born with it. That desire to be with him. That love sick longing. Like I'm right here with you, but I wish I could get a little closer. And it's not out of insecurity, and it's not out of uh, an a unfulfilled place. It's just, you know what lovesick is, right? Like, can I just be around you more? Can we be more smushed together? I think, I think of it as, like, man, before Courtney and Nathaniel got married, they would meet in our office, and we were talking and stuff, and it was like, that, you know, Nathaniel's arm, like, then he's touching Courtney's hair, then he's, you know, he's just like, they're right next to each other, they're, they're smushed together, like they couldn't be any closer, and he's still just like, just, oh, I just wish I could be with you, you know, like, and he still is like that with her, and I'd be like, you guys, put a pillow between you, we're trying to have a conversation, <laughs> right? It's exactly how it was, and I love it. That is like a picture of lovesick, right? I'm with you, but I just want more. Okay, so our longings are even our emotional places that, that well up on the inside of us. So where would be within me? What is the loves, the longings, the desires, the daydreams? And it comes from communion with God. When I'm where? Near. When I'm near you. So, I'm not very near to Cynthia right now. I wouldn't call this near. I can see her, but I'm not near. But right now, I'm pretty near to Audrey. And there's something about like a choosing to come near, right? So, sorry, Audrey. When I'm near you, what? My heart and my soul, so again, this is personal, will sing and worship. So just being close to God, intentionally coming close, Being close is being in his presence, because presence is about being together. Like if I'm in, if I'm in Audrey's presence, we're in the same room. I'm not in her presence on FaceTime. It's a cheap substitute, isn't it? Like if your kids are far away, Susan, is she still here? Like when her kids are far away, they get deployed. FaceTime is good enough because they can't be next to each other, but being near is way better. Sometimes we just have to come close. Okay. So being near you, my heart and my soul, these inner places, the inside of me, there's a song on the inside of us. In verse 3, it says, even the sparrows and the swallows. Well, sparrows and swallows are lovely, but they're kind of small and insignificant. Like, we don't even think about sparrows and swallows unless they're in our raft, in our, our rafters or something. And we had a little swallow that got from the church this summer. And we didn't even really notice it until we started noticing the bird poop on the window. I mean, it, we thought we heard a chirping once, but, you know, they're just not really noticeable. They're just these little things, right? Okay, that's to me what this says to me. Even the sparrows and swallows are welcome to build a nest. What's a nest? What, what does that represent? Home. Safety. 
a resting place. So even, even the smallest, like God still welcomes. If you feel small and insignificant today, you're welcome to build a nest. And not just like out in the back shed, you're welcome to build a nest. Among the altars, that's like, that's a significant place. The altars are, for, even among the altars, for the birds to raise their young. So not just to like have a, a short-term resting place, but a place to raise and build a family. They're welcome to make that their long-term home in God's presence. What does the altar represent? His presence, a holy place, a place where you lay down your life. Right? So we are invited to build a nest, to build a home on, on his altar and raise our young. I think that's amazing. I think of Romans 12 there where it says um, to present yourselves as a living sacrifice. Romans 12, 1. To, to bring yourself, to bring your life, to bring everything about your life, your family, your, raising your kids, the way that you would connect to your neighbors, um, your everyday life things, so that we can, like those little birds, build our home in that place of his presence and make our lives an altar. In verse 4, it kind of continues in the same thought. What pleasure fills those who, where, or what, live, where, every day in his temple. So it's a similar thing. We're, li we're living. What is, what is living? Breathing, functioning, cooking, probably, doing laundry, going to work, paying bills, <laughs> really basic stuff, right? What pleasure fills those who live, who do life, who do everything that they do, live every day in your temple, enjoying you as they worship in your presence. So again, it's... Uh, it, it evokes something within us. Worship, his presence does that. But, living every day in the temple. What is the temple? It's you. It's me. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Do you not know that you are a temple of God? That the Spirit of God dwells in you? So bringing your everyday life, living, with the reality that you are the temple, Christ in you, the hope of glory, he dwells in you, being present to the reality that Christ is in you. What does it look like for us to be aware of that? That every day we live in the reality that we are his temple. Am I making any sense to y'all? This is a lot, I think it's a lot deeper than just this poetry, beautiful, I love this song. This is one of my favorite songs. But this is, I mean, it's like, this is a pathway to God's presence. And this is how we can be aware and practice the presence every day of our lives. It's not living compartmentalized, like, you know, God is here and now all my life is over here. I mean, he's just in everything. He's in people, he's in community, he's in your family, he's where you are building your home, where you're doing life. He's even saying, who you are is my temple, it's where I want my presence to dwell. It's pretty major. I'm in, going to intentionally live from that reality. I am his temple and we dwell together daily. Where I am, because I said yes to him, there he is. His presence is as close as 
my breath. And we take that and we couple it with what we just read in verse 3 of our surrendered lives, those altars. It's not so much about a song where it says worship rises up from that place. Every day as I worship in your presence and join you every day as I worship in your presence. It's not so much about a song in that moment as it is about the posture of our hearts, isn't it? Our place of connection, our place of intentionality, and our awareness that everything that we do, including mechanic work on your car, is as unto the Lord. Like the little things of life, even the way you drive on the freeway can be as unto the Lord. Think about that as you have road rage next time. <laughs> and then God, you know, just says, let's just pause on that. Pause in his presence is the next thing. Like I want to shift your reality from being disconnected and, and doing life over here and then coming to me over here. I want to just intersect all of it and mush it into one until there's no separation. Now let's pause in my presence and just let it take on root inside of me. So let's just do that for a minute. Just close your eyes. Pause in his presence. Have a little daydream with God. What is my life? In full connection to you, God. Just even as we're pausing, I, I hear that other psalm, and I think it's Psalms 8. It says, who am I? Who am I that you are mindful of me? Who am I that you, the Son of Man, visited me, that you call me? I'm totally butchering it, but that's, it's, who am I in your presence, God? That you would consider me. That you would consider that my life would be a habitation for your dwelling place. Who am I that you, the Son of Man, that you would visit me in my daydreams, in my longings, in my dish doing, in my parenting, in my job? It's amazing that your presence wants to just invade every part of that. Okay, verse 5. How enriched are they who, what? Find. Find their strength in the Lord. Again, where? Within their hearts. How enriched are they who find their strength in the Lord? So we're finding strength in the Lord, not in our hearts, but within our hearts. It says, are the highways of holiness. The Hebrew is literally, the highways of holiness here, it would literally be in the Hebrew. Roads are in their hearts. So by implication it is that there are ways that are already in your heart that will lead you to God's presence. It's kind of cool. And then next verse, verse 6. Even when their paths wind through where? The dark valley of tears. So even, that sounds like a place I don't want to go, the dark valley of tears. Sounds kind of scary there. But even there, it says they, that means us, all of us, have this ability to dig deep 
and find a pleasant pool where other people would only find pain. That's cool. How many of you are going through a valley of tears right now? You don't have to raise your hand. But I'm gonna bet there's a lot more in here than are willing to shout from the rooftops. Even in that place, you can find strength in the Lord and he's going to help you dig deep. And in that place, there's a pleasant pool. That sounds refreshing. That sounds like you can get a drink there. You can rest, a pleasant pool. I think of an oasis. Others would only find pain there, but not you. Not you, the ones who carry his presence. You're walking the pathway of his presence, and so you're going to find a pleasant pool. And God is going to give to you a brook of blessing filled from the rain of an outpouring. So this place of tears, that's what I'm thinking of. You cried so many tears, an outpouring of tears. And God is going to use those tears in this season that you've been crying out. And he's creating a pool for you to find refreshment and to find even joy and pleasure and strength in. And it's going to become a brook of blessing. And isn't that what we know to be true about God? In Romans where it says, you know, he's working all things together for our good. That's what that verse is talking about. And when you can't see it right now, he's saying, come with me and let's dig deep. Because beneath this crap that we're walking through right now is a, a brook of bliss. A brook of blessing. And your tears are filling that space. And it's going to be a life-giving place. And they, that's us, we grow stronger and stronger with every step forward. So that isn't super hard. It's just taking one step forward and another step forward and another step forward. It doesn't say that you have to go to battle. It doesn't say you have to get out your sword. It doesn't say you have to fight the lion and the bear or any of those things right there or slay a giant. It just says in those moments, you just get to Take another step forward, my presence goes with you. Take another step forward, and you're going to grow stronger. Take another step forward, and I'm with you. That's really encouraging. I think it is. And when you take those steps forward, the God of all gods will go before you. Friends, there's a place right now, if you're in the midst of the Valley of Tears, there's a place so deep in God's presence, and he's going before you. There's an access point, even through your tears and crying, out to the Lord. But he wants to meet you and fill you and refresh you and strengthen you. So right now, because the next thing he says is pause in my presence. Let's pause in his presence. And I say, strength now in Jesus' name. Strength now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I think pause in his presence is probably one of the hardest spaces to be, right? It is for me. 
Anyone want to raise their hand and say if that's hard for them too? I don't like to pause just at all. But to just be, which is what Selah, pausing his presence is, it's to just be and to sit in it, not to do anything, that's a pathway. That's a practice of his presence. In verse 9, God starts doing, this is, this is, some of this is just the coming upon right here. God, your wraparound presence is our defense. Your kind, in your kindness, look upon the faces of your anointed ones. God is just sometimes, he just comes and wraps himself around us. And that just came right on out of a pause. Just being. It says, God, your wraparound presence. I would, I would love to experience that just right now. God, your wraparound presence. It's my defense. And in your kindness, I am praying, Lord, that you would look upon the faces of your anointed ones here today. For just one day of what? Intimacy with you is like a thousand days of joy rolled into one. I'd rather stand at the threshold in front of the gate beautiful, ready to go in and worship my God than to live my life without you in the most beautiful palace of the wicked. What is intimacy? Sharing, yeah. Relationship. Being close. It's intentional, right? Is it vulnerable? It's making yourself bare. Hiding nothing. Maybe looking in the eye. Maybe a little uncomfortable. It's, it's a place of heart-to-heart -heart connection. And one day of intentional intimacy with God is like a thousand other regular days where you might catch a glimpse of him or you might recognize his voice here and there. The Lord is saying, setting aside time to look me in the eyes will fill your cup more than anything else, more than anything else you could ever imagine. If you are a quality time person, you totally understand this, right? I think on some level we're all, we're all kind of a quality time person. Someone who takes the time to look at you, to not be looking somewhere else, wondering what else is going on while you're talking to them. Um, it's taking the time to look face to face, connect heart to heart, be vulnerable, share oneself. That means a lot, even friend to friend, doesn't it? Or spouse to spouse. Sometimes maybe you're fighting with somebody. I've never done that with my spouse, but I've heard that people do that. And I've also heard that reconnecting, even through intimacy, 
shifts everything. Anybody else heard that? If you feel distant from the Lord, make a God date. Where you ready yourself. You come to him vulnerably. Say, here I am. Let's connect. Sometimes when it's been a while, it's like kind of awkward. But just one day of intimacy with God erases a thousand regular ones. That's pretty amazing. For the Lord God is brighter than the brilliance of a sunrise. That's just a true statement right there. That's just who he is. He's brighter than a brilliant, the brilliance of a sunrise. Wrapping himself around me like a shield. Again, God just does that. It's who he is and it's what he does. He wraps himself around us like a shield because he's so generous with his gifts of grace and glory. And again, it brings it back to us. This is another pathway of God's presence. And I think this one we forget about. But those who walk along his paths with integrity, doing life with integrity, that's pretty simple, isn't it? But it opens something up so that we will never lack one thing that we need. If you're a business owner here today, if you're an employee of any kind, you can apply this immediately. Walk with integrity. You'll never lack one thing you need. You will get to experience God's presence of provision and his presence just through walking with integrity. I think that's pretty, pretty cool. And the Lord of Heaven's armies, what euphoria fills those who, what? Trust. So those are also, they're actions, but they're also places. Trust is like a place in your heart. Trust is a place, um, I don't know, we don't always give trust, do we? I hear a lot of people say, I don't trust people very easily. Or I trust people way too easily. Well, the Lord is saying, euphoria. I don't, I don't know what some of the more like NASB kind of versions would say. What's the word instead of euphoria? Blessed? Thank you. I like blessed too. Blessed. Just by trusting. Integrity. Trust. Intimacy. Making your life an altar. Connecting through community and people. Your regular life stuff. Like, he's in the middle of all of it. He said worship is an, an afterthought, an overflow response from connecting with him in these other ways. Your desires, your dreams, your longings, your daydreams. It's pretty cool. God wants to show up in all of the places. All the places you are all the places you're going, even if it's the Valley of Tears, because we're all going to go there. Is there anybody here who has not experienced the Valley of Tears yet? No, there's not. We're all going to do it, but there's a place for us of his presence that we can, we can enter into. So, I don't know, I find this especially encouraging. 
And I also, for me, and maybe I'm super basic, and I probably am, but there's things about his presence that I think we just make a lot harder than need to. And his presence is actually really practical, and it's found in just about every place, if we're looking for it, if we're postured to connect to him. So at the bottom of your Psalms 84, there's three questions. And we're just gonna talk in our table groups. We dismissed the kids late today, and they really like to have an hour. So um, we're gonna take the next 15 minutes at 12.30, I wanna encourage you to go check your kids out from JPC Kids. And then, um, but we're gonna take the next 15 minutes and just talk at our table. And the questions are, did some of these pathways to experiencing God surprise you? Have you experienced him in any of these ways? And then, I just wanna talk about pausing in God's presence. And how often we make a, a practice of doing that. It's kind of like that tent of meeting that Nathaniel was talking about with us. So. Um, there you go. Let's talk amongst ourselves for the next little while. And you guys have done this before now. Well, did any of these pathways surprise you that we should be talking about?